Well, good morning, 11 o'clock crowd. How y'all doing today? And welcome to what turns out to be my favorite sermon series of the whole year. This is it. I love this. You're going to see why in just a few moments. But I also want to remind you next week, we got a brand new thing. It's going to be so exciting for you. It's called Rookie of the Year. Don't want to miss it. And last time to get in on Thursday food trucks this coming Thursday. Great way to have church and then have a long weekend. So that would be kind of cool. As you remember, throughout this series, we've been kind of picking on lawyers. Well, in the last series, we've been kind of picking on lawyers. So we promised we'd pick on pastors during this series. But some people said we haven't been quite hard enough. So try this one on for size. A Baptist preacher just finished preaching a sermon for the day, and he went to the back of the auditorium to shake the hands of the people leaving. And he, he shook a few hands of adults as they were leaving. And then little Trevor, little seven-year-old Trevor, he's a son of a deacon, he comes through the line and reaches up to shake the pastor's hand. And, and the pastor, how you doing, little Trevor? He said, I'm doing good today, pastor. How are you? He said, I'm doing fine. But the pastor could feel that there was something in Trevor's hand. So he kind of pulled his hand away and looked at it. He said, Trevor, what is this? He said, well, pastor, it's, it's money. It's money. Pa- Trevor, I don't want to take your money. He said, well, pastor, I, I want you to have it. And he thought for a minute. He said, my daddy says you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. And I just wanted to help you out a little bit. (laughs) Kind of the joke inside the joke, if you don't mind me telling you, is that this joke did not have the name Trevor in it originally. You can see from my notes, if you can see up close, that there's some little light blue lines where I wrote in Trevor. Originally, the name there was Jonathan. (laughs) Telling the truth. Am I telling the truth? I'm telling the truth. (laughs) Ow! All right. So I've had my fun. Y'all see you later. Um, Three weeks long, three key players. There are three players in the book of Philemon. There's Paul, there's Philemon, and there's Onesimus. You just got to keep those three names in your mind as we kind of go through this. We're going to discover some kind of cool things today. Philippians verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So here's the aged the legendary Paul is writing this letter. I say aged, he's really only 63, but ministry's been hard on him. There have been beatings, there have been imprisonments, there have been betrayals, stonings, there have been riots, all manner of things have happened to him. And on top of that, Paul's already had to walk thousands and thousands of miles. And later in the letter, you'll see he literally calls himself the old man. So he writes to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. So he writes to Philemon and Philemon's family. That would be his wife, Aphia. That would be his oldest son, Archippus, who serves in full-time ministry there in Colossae, right there in the church that meets in Philemon's home. You say, wow, the church meets in Philemon's home, so Philemon must have a big house. Well, first of all, their spatial requirements are not the same as ours, number one. And number two, yes, he was very wealthy and had, no doubt, a big house. At least 100 or more people could meet in, probably, in the, in the kind of house that he would have. He was very wealthy, very wealthy businessman. He was generous, full of faith, full of kindness. And as you can see in these next verses, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father. This is Paul writing to Philemon and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Now, when you read this, you think, okay, I've read all of Paul's letters. This sounds like a traditional greeting at the beginning of one of Paul's letters, but this is no typical letter. Uh, Of the 13 letters that Paul wrote, and some scholars say 14, this by far is the most personal. Remember the opening line. He doesn't say, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to open his heart here to Philemon. He's going to bear his heart because he's going to ask Philemon to do something that's probably fairly difficult for him to do. So, Paul alludes to that here in these next few verses. So I want to unpack these verses so you can get a feel for what's happening here. So he says in verse 8, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, and I could order you to do what you ought to do. Paul says, man, I could just tell you what to do, and you got to do it. Well, how could you be so bold as to say that, Paul? Well, three reasons. One, the authority of Scripture backs him. Because he says, 
He says, notice the phrase, to do what you ought to do. God's behind this. God says you ought to do this. It's in the Bible. Number two, because Paul has a special relationship with Philemon. Because he led Philemon to Christ, as we're going to see in a few verses. Paul led Philemon to Christ, as we're going to see in just a moment. And thirdly, he has an apostolic relationship with the church that meets in Philemon's home. Who meets in Philemon's home? He's in Colossae. So the Colossians, remember that book, the book of Colossians? It was written to the people who meet in Philemon's house. So what do you mean Paul has an apostolic relationship? Well, he's kind of like on the oversight team, but he didn't plant the church. A friend of his, a disciple of his named Epaphras, he planted the church, and now Epaphras is with Paul in house arrest in Rome. And Philemon is the guy who's kind of running the show here. But Paul's going for something deeper. He could command him, but he could just say, get rid of this and do this. But instead, he wants to appeal to his heart. He wants to get at what's going on in Philemon's heart. So you say, well, did Paul push aside his apostolic authority? No, he didn't push aside his apostolic authority. He actually established it because he's so generous, so open-handed, and so humble here. So then he goes on, he says, I'd rather not appeal to authority, I'd rather appeal to love. So you look in verse nine. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Now remember, six verses ago, we read that Paul commended Philemon on his love for all the saints. So probably, and here's how I want you to remember, this is a letter that Philemon is reading. And I'm gonna set it up in a moment, but as he's reading through this, he probably thinks, well, just three verses ago, and by the way, there's no punctuation in the Greek, so there are no verses, there are no, there are no commas, no periods, and all those kinds of things. So some words ago, you commended me for loving the saints, so you're probably appealing to me because I love people. And that may be true, but Paul is actually not really appealing to Philemon's love for people, but Paul's love for one specific person, that person we meet in the next verse. I then as Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for, for my son Onesimus who became my son while I'm in chains. Now Philemon is very familiar with who Onesimus is. Philemon knows Onesimus because Onesimus used to be Philemon's slave, now runaway slave. And in the Roman Empire, if you found a runaway slave, the Romans found a runaway slave, it means immediate death. So here's the problem. On top of being a runaway slave, Onesimus stole a great deal of money from Philemon before he took off. So he's in double jeopardy. He's a runaway slave and he's a thief. He's stolen a significant amount of money from Philemon. So let me set up this scene. In this particular imprisonment in Rome, and Paul's gonna be imprisoned in Rome two times. This is the first one. In this particular imprisonment in Rome, Paul writes four letters. He writes a letter to the church at Ephesus. He writes a letter to the church at Philippi. It's called Philippians. He writes a letter to the church that meets in Philemon's home. It's called Colossians. And he writes a letter to Philemon. So what we have here, this guy Onesimus, he now stands before Philemon. This is some time later, okay? This is not weeks later. This is months and months and months. So and I want to kind of shift to kind of storytelling mode now, okay? So I want you to picture this. Here's this guy, Onesimus, and he's... I don't know, Philemon was out in, the, in, out in the street and he sees Onesimus walking toward him. Onesimus actually made it to his house and knocked on his door. I don't really know, but here's Onesimus and here's Philemon and Philemon's looking right at this guy. Now here's what's interesting. Philemon is carrying, most scholars believe, three letters in his satchel. Number one, he's got a letter to the church in Colossae, which is where he's from the church that meets in Philemon's home. Number two, he's got a letter to the Laodiceans, which we don't get in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It wasn't part of the inspired word of God, but it's a letter that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans, which is a small town not far away. Undoubtedly, Paul intends him to deliver that. And then he's got a letter to Philemon himself. And so um, when Onesimus first comes to Philemon's door, Philemon has got to be completely mystified. Here is a runaway slave, come back. That never happens, why? Because to come back to the town you ran away from, somebody there knows a Roman, and you're dead. It is completely over. So probably Philemon is looking at Onesimus, and he's thinking, have you come to harm my family? Have you come to steal more money from me? And then he notices there's another guy with Onesimus. 
This guy's name is Tychicus. And you're, just stick that name in your head because you're going to see him in just a moment. And he knows who this guy is. He's one of Paul's top traveling companions. He's one of the right-hand men to Paul. I mean, this guy has been in prison with Paul. He's served Paul. So imagine the scene. So here it is. There's Onesimus. There's this, there's this sense in Philemon's heart. This guy's come to hurt me, hurt my family, steal from me. And then he notices Tychicus. And what, what's going on here? And no doubt this gives pause a little bit to Philemon. So I imagine that Onesimus approaches Philemon and he hands him the personal letter first. Number one, because Paul probably told him, don't try to give him the, you give him this letter. And let, let's, let's handle this personal matter before we go anywhere else. Hand him the letter. And when he hands him the letter, I can kind of see Onesimus going really low in complete surrender because he doesn't know how this is going to turn out. Will Philemon forgive me or will he prosecute me? Will he turn me over to the Roman authorities? When Philemon reads the letter, he comes to verse 10. So this is taking me like 12 minutes to get here. But remember, it's only taken, it's only taken Philemon like two or three minutes to get to this point in the letter. So he's got, it's been months since he's seen this guy. And there's all kinds of stuff going through his head. So imagine his confusion when he gets to verse 10. I appeal to you, Paul says, for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. And Philemon can't believe what he's reading. Wait, wait. My runaway slave is a believer now? And he knows Paul? See, Paul led Onesimus to Christ like Paul led Philemon to Christ. So now they're on equal planes in terms of the gospel. And on top of that, Paul, he says, my son Onesimus, Paul is giving this runaway slave uh, a, a title of endearment and affection. In fact, the highest one that Paul ever gives. He's only given it to one other person, and that's Timothy. And here he gives it to Onesimus. He says, my son Onesimus. Not the slave Onesimus, not church member Onesimus, but my son Onesimus. And he also makes it clear that Onesimus was led to Christ while Paul was in prison in Rome. In other words, that, that, that it, Paul led Timothy, excuse me, Paul led Onesimus to Christ while he was in house arrest. That's important. You'll see why in just a moment. So maybe it's time for us to just pause a second and give you some answers. Because all throughout the series, we've been sprinkling some questions and not answering them, right? Saying we'll get to that later in the book. And now it's probably time to explain this to you. So here's what you need to do. You, you, you sit down and you get out a Bible and you turn to Acts chapter 28. And then you get another Bible and you open up to the book of Philemon. And then you get another Bible, you open up to Philippians chapter 4. You get another Bible, you open it up to Colossians chapter 4. Because all of these deal with this same scenario. And, and, and as you look at this, you can kind of put it together and come up with some educated guesses. So here's how it, here's how it plays out probably. It, it could, there, there could be some variances, but the text points this direction, okay? So when Onesimus ran away, he didn't go to the world-class city in Ephesus. We asked a couple of weeks ago, why didn't he do that? Now, let me just say, for those of you here for the first time, Ephesus is only 100 miles away from Colossae. Colossae is a small town. Ephesus is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It's on a big port. It's New York City. It's the New York City of the Roman Empire. It's got tons of people there. So why didn't he just go 100 miles away and hang out there instead of going to Rome? Well, the reason he didn't is because Philemon is a very wealthy businessman in a small town called Colossae, which means he's probably got huge business dealings in Ephesus, at least there with the port. Not only that, there are lots of people from Colossae who would travel to Ephesus, and Philemon was well known. It was likely that at some point somebody who knew Philemon would know that that man right there is his runaway slave. He'd get turned over to the Romans and he would die. So instead, here's what he does. He goes a thousand miles away. He doesn't go to Ephesus. He may have gone to Ephesus, got on a boat, but then he goes a thousand miles away to the city of Rome. What he's thinking is, this is a great place to hide. I could mix it in with all these people, and I will never be noticed. That is undoubtedly why he stole such a large sum of money from Philemon. Because no one can get, if somebody guesses that you're a slave and, you, and the inquiry is made, you'll be found out and you'll be dead. So he's got to go a thousand miles on foot, not to mention two major, major boat rides. I mean, this is like saying I want a first class ticket to 
Bangkok. This is, you don't just walk up and say, fly me to Bangkok. I mean, you gotta pay for this. So he steals a, a, a large sum of money. Now, how did Onesimus run into Paul? We asked you that a week or so ago. He couldn't run into Paul. Well, didn't Paul lead him to Christ? Yes, but he didn't run into Paul. How do you know that? Because in Acts 28, it tells us Paul's on house arrest. He's chained, as we'll see in a moment, to a Praetorian guard. That means that, that means that Onesimus had to look him up. And why would he do that? Because Paul knows Philemon. The last person that Onesimus wants to run into in Rome is Paul, because all Paul has to do is send correspondence to Philemon. Philemon shows up and says, that's my guy. They kill him, and that's the end of, that's the end of Onesimus. He'd have to look for him. He would have to intention, to get, to get led to Christ by Paul, he had to be in Paul's presence, and to be in Paul's presence, he'd have to go searching for him. Why would he do that? Let's go back to, let's go back to the greeting and, and read it a little more carefully. Paul says to, to Philemon, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God, Philemon, as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith. How'd you hear about his faith? I hear about your faith in the Lord and your love for all the saints. Paul, how'd you hear about Philemon's? Because you never, Paul's never been to Colossae. I told you he didn't plant that church. Epaphras planted that church. He'd never been there. So I, how does he hear about his love? He goes on and says, I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith, which no doubt he already was, so that you may be full of all understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. How'd you hear about his love to get that great joy and encouragement? Because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. How do you know that? How did Paul hear about Philemon's faith and about Philemon sharing his faith and about how Philemon loves people and all that? How did Paul hear about that. All the people in the church in Colossae are a thousand miles away, except one, Onesimus. How many services had Onesimus attended in Philemon's house? As a servant, probably, who knows how many? 50, 100? Sometimes I met, sometimes I met every day, so maybe more than 100. How many times did Philemon, who obviously shares his faith, attempted to share his faith with Onesimus, his slave? How did the impact of the gospel changing the life of Philemon impact Onesimus? And not just Philemon, but what about all the other ones that gave their lives to Christ and joined the church there in Colossae? What about their life change? How did that impact Onesimus? So one day Onesimus woke up and decided since he was born a slave and never been free, that this was it. Today, he was gonna live a free man. He thought that being on his own would solve all of his problems. So he made a plan and he executed it flawlessly. He stole a bunch of money from Philemon that he would need for the journey and need to get settled in Rome. And he set out to find real freedom. And now he's in the city of Rome where no one can find him. Except that he can never really get close to anybody. Because if he gets close to anybody, maybe some of those telltale signs that he had been a slave will show through. Or maybe he'll open his heart and share his secret with somebody. But that secret could be deadly if they decide for a few shekels to turn him in. He could get close to anybody. The truth is, the gospel that he had heard over and over again, the gospel that he had seen played out in the lives of Philemon and all the other people in the church began to get to him. His conscience began to feel the weight of his own sin, a kind of conviction that he could not escape. He was free on the outside, but he was a slave on the inside, a slave to sin. And so he knew from Philemon, and he knew from the church that meets in his house, that Paul was on house arrest in Rome. How? Because they're praying for him while he's on house arrest. And after he got there, he thought he could be completely free, but his insides were killing him. I've got to find Paul so he can share that gospel with me that he shared with Philemon, that changed Philemon's life, that brought him peace and brought him joy. I need that peace. I need that joy. But I know it's risky because he's chained to a Praetorian, a Roman guard. And if I get there and he recognizes me and says, aren't you the runaway slave? I'm dead. So maybe I can get there and Paul can give me the gospel. Then I'll be found out and then I'll die. But at least when I die, I can go to heaven at peace with God. So Paul was on house arrest, as I said, chained to a series of 
Praetorian guards on rotating shifts. How do you know that? Well, because we see that in history. We also see that in the New Testament. So these guards guarded it's Caesar's household. You see, Rome doesn't really do prisons. If you're in a prison, it's because you're going to get executed. So what happened was Paul appealed to Caesar, and so now he's in Caesar's like compound. He's on house arrest there. It's not really a prison. It's on house arrest. So you're either exiled or you're killed in the Roman Empire. And so these guards are the same guards that guard Caesar and the same guards that guard Caesar's family and also guard those prisoners on house arrest, Paul being one of them. And so the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 that some of Caesar's household have come to know Christ. How did that happen? Because Paul, the prisoner, is hanging out with the emperor? No, but the Roman guards are. So someone chained to Paul gets the gospel, gets born again, and then the next day serves Caesar by guarding his children, and then the next day serves Caesar himself and at times shares their faith. That's exactly what's happening here. So verse 11, and remember, Philemon's reading, his mind is blown. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and me. Remember, in previous weeks we said the reason this is in yellow is because Onesimus, his name means useful. It's a play on words. Paul says, I'm sending him, who's my very heart, back to you. In previous weeks we talked about how Onesimus served Paul, and not just served Paul, but served with Paul. And even more than that, he became so close to Paul and had so much of Paul's heart. And Paul loved him to such a degree that Paul actually calls him his son. And he makes no bones here about how much it's going to hurt him to send Onesimus back. Verse 13, I would like to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps a reason he was separated from you for a while was you could have him back for good, but not as a slave. Better than a slave, as a dear brother. Philemon can't believe what he's reading. He, he can't believe it. The slaves become a brother? Wait, my slave is now my brother. Something very powerful is happening here. I wish I had another week to deal with it. Paul is, and I want you to see it, Paul is killing the institution of slavery from the inside out. Paul could have said, you need to let this man go. I don't want you to practice slavery. I want you to stop that. Let him go. You know better. He could have said that, but, and he commanded him, and Philemon would have done it, but his inside, his heart would have been the same place. So the genius of Paul here, instead of commanding on the outside, he goes for the heart, and he and he. And he It's just brilliant how he brings this together. He's no longer a slave, but better than a slave. He's your brother. Not just brother. He's your dear brother. I'm your spiritual father. I'm his spiritual father. The slaves become a brother. Truthfully, the slave was always a potential brother, and he derived his dignity as a human, as a man, from the fact that he's a creation of God. There you go. Yes, he's an image bearer of God. And and really what Paul is saying here, no one should be a slave because everyone is an image bearer of God. He says he's very dear to me while I'm reading the text and even dearer to you, both as a man, notice, not as a slave, not as a servant, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. In a sense, Paul's saying, Philemon, now Onesimus is a believer and no doubt you begin to see him in a different light Perhaps you would have honored God if you had always seen him in that same light. And all the while, I imagine Onesimus is bowed to the ground because he still doesn't know what's going on inside Philemon's heart. In fact, it's silence. Philemon's just reading the letter. Will he forgive or will he prosecute? Verse 17. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you welcome me. But did he? Did he welcome him? Verse 18. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this letter with my own hand. I will repay it back, not to mention the fact that you owe me your own self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit. You know what's cool about this? An alternate definition of the name Onesimus is benefit. In a sense, what he's saying is, I love the way this reads. He says, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit. I do wish, brother, that I might have Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a co-worker, as an equal. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. But you know what? This letter never answers the question. 
This, never letter, this letter never says whether or not Onesimus lived or died. But you know what? Remember, remember, Onesimus has three letters in his satchel. One to Philemon, which he pulled out, handed to him, which we've read down to, about to verse 21. Onesimus is bowed down before him. Philemon is reading. But I wonder if in one of the other letters there's anything said about Onesimus. One that Philemon has not yet read. That he will, that he will read and then pass on to the church it meets in his house. Let's look in Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Tychicus will tell you, the new, now this is the letter to the Colossians, which after this whole personal matter is settled, Philemon will no doubt read to the church it meets in his house. Tychicus, Paul is writing, Tychicus will tell all you the news about me. Remember Tychicus? I mentioned to him earlier, I said, keep him in your brain. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you with the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who's one of you. Mm. Not who is a former slave. He's one of you. They will tell you everything that's happening here. No mention of his being a slave. No mention of his being a slave seeking release. No mention of the crimes committed against Philemon. Instead, he's mentioned alongside Tychicus as one of Paul's chief co-workers. You know what's going to cost Philemon to read this if he doesn't forgive? He's going to have to get down to the end of it and read. He says, one, Paul says, verse 22, back to the letter to the Philemon. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you through your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, the guy who planted the church, sends you greetings, as does And so does Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now, could you could you indulge me one one um, extra story, just one? When we close the New Testament, there's a number of mysteries left unanswered, like what happened to Onesimus. We don't know. When the New Testament ends and you read all the way through the book of Revelation, you go, oh, what happened to the guy? Dang, wish I knew. There's also another mystery. There are numerous mysteries, but here's one, like what happened to the church at Ephesus. Remember I told you a moment ago that Paul, in this imprisonment, wrote four letters. Philemon, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians. We studied this letter last year. And I mentioned to you that this is Paul's, and scholars agree. I'm not a scholar, but scholars agree. This is Paul's most spiritual letter. Not his most theological, but the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, is Paul's most spiritual letter. They're greatly commended in that letter. So if you think about it, the greatest church in the world was Jerusalem. Then it became Antioch. Then it became the church at Ephesus. So when Paul writes this letter, they're at their zenith, the biggest, strongest. Paul is at his greatest fruit in the city of Ephesus and in Asia Minor. The greatest persecution, but the greatest fruit. Now... At the, but 30 years after Paul writes these four letters, things don't look too good for the Ephesian church. See, I mentioned to you, it goes like this. Paul is the bishop, then Timothy's the bishop, then John's the bishop. Remember John? He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We just finished studying that. Then they tried to kill John, but they couldn't. They killed all the other disciples, but they couldn't kill John. They boiled him in oil. You can read about him in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. They boiled him in oil, but he lived. So to get rid of him, they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. And while John is on the Isle of Patmos, one day on a Sunday when he's in the Spirit worshiping Jesus, Jesus appears to him and says, of the 13 churches in Asia Minor, I want you to write letters from me to seven of them. One of them was to the church at Ephesus. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write. This is 30 years after Paul writes that letter to that great spiritual powerhouse church. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. That would be Jesus. I know your deeds and your hard work and your perseverance. That's good. I know that you, can toler- you cannot tolerate wicked men, but you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you've found them false. That's good. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. That's good. Verse 4. Yet this I hold against you, that you've forsaken your first love. Not that you wandered away from your first love. Not that you lost your first love. Not that you've been beguiled out of your first love. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. 
and repent and do the things you did at first. If you don't repent, this is Jesus talking, I will come and remove the lampstand out of his place. Your purpose and reason for being a church and you will die. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then Jesus ends the letter the same way he, he ends all seven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you don't repent, wow, I will come, Jesus himself will come, and will remove the lampstand from its place. Strong words. What happened? Did they repent or not? And when you close the book of Revelation, it's a question mark. It's a mystery. What would you say if I told you that the answer to the mystery, what happened to Onesimus, and the answer to the mystery, what happened to the church at Ephesus, was the same story. Same answer. Neil Cole, in his book, Journeys to Significance, includes a letter from a man. It's not a letter that made it into the Bible, but it's a letter from the first century. It's a letter from a man named Ignatius, a bishop, Ignatius of Antioch, that he writes to the church at Ephesus. It answers two questions. One, what happened to Onesimus? And two, what happened to the church at Ephesus? Again, it's written... 30 years after the 30 years. It was written 30 years down the road. It's written in Greek, translated in English, and included in um, Neil Cole's book. Let me read the letter to you. Ignatius, the bishop Ignatius of Antioch writes to the Ephesian church these words. I gave a godly welcome to your church, which has also endeared itself to us by reason of your upright nature, marked as it is by faith in Jesus Christ. And your love of God for him. So something's happened. Their faith is back. Their passion for Jesus is back. You're imitators of God, and it was God's bold faith that stirred you once more to do the sort of thing you do naturally and now have done to perfection. In God's name, therefore, I received your large congregation in the person of Onesimus, your bishop in this world. Oh, my gosh. A man whose love is beyond words. My prayer is that you should be that you should love him in the spirit of Christ Jesus and all be like him. Blessed is he, blessed is he, God, who let you have such a bishop. You deserve it. We can see from his letter something has happened in this church. And we know that Jesus once said that he who's forgiven much is loved much. It, it took the influence of a man like Onesimus who knew firsthand what true forgiveness was really all about to stir up the church once again to her first love. This little known runaway slave has not only found the freedom he so desperately desired, but he's been elevated to a role of leadership in the church that led to the revitalization of what was literally the most important and most significant church in the first century. As it turns out, the bishops that presided in Ephesus over the churches in Asia Minor were Paul, the legendary great apostle, Timothy, his great right-hand man, John, the venerable apostle, the last alive to see Jesus, followed by Onesimus, a former runaway slave. Each week we've kind of left you with some takeaways. This week I only have one. It's a takeaway that you already know. Your mother already told you this over and over again. Never judge a book by its cover. You can't look on the outside of somebody and see what God has put on the inside. On top of that, you, you, you can't look at how a person is on the outside and know what God is doing on the inside. Can I just tell you something? There's treasure in there. God put treasure in there. It may not look like it, and, and there may be some people in your life you've given up on, because they seem wayward or they seem stubborn. They don't seem like they're coming. But let me tell you something. There's some treasure in there. How do you know that? Because God put it there. How do you know that? Because in Philippians it says there's treasure in these earthen vessels. It ain't a lot on the outside, but God put treasure on the inside. And let me tell you something. There's treasure inside of you. You can't judge yourself by your cover. You can't judge your story by your last chapters. 
You may say to me, Michael, oh, listen, I don't want people to read my story because there's some things in my story I'm ashamed of. There's some things in my story I've done. There's some places I've been. There's some things I've said, some things I haven't said that I don't want anybody knowing about. And you let that define your present. Your past doesn't define your present. What God decides about your future should decide your present. Because I'm here to tell you right now that the pen is not in your hand. The pen is in the hand of God. And he's still writing the chapters in your book. Don't look back at those past chapters. Those are under the blood. Look forward at the blank pages and wonder what can God do with that. I'm here to tell you, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, all that God has planned for those who love him. But see, here's the key. Paul saw something in Onesimus. He could have just been another runaway slave that died a slave. But Paul saw the treasure in that earthen vessel and he believed it. And when he believed it, he drew it out of Onesimus. Isn't that amazing? He drew it out of Onesimus. And at some point, Onesimus believed it. That's what you got to do. You got to believe that the best days are yet ahead. You got to believe that eye is not seen, that ear is not heard, that it hasn't entered your heart or your mind all that God has in store for you. You got to believe that. And when Onesimus believed it, he said, despite my background, Despite my upbringing, despite my slavery, despite my setbacks, despite my lack of fill it in, God has a plan for me. And when he believed it, he became it. That's it right there. That's your takeaway. If when he believed it, he became it. When you believe it, you become it. And what happened? What happened? He put the most significant church in the first century back on its feet. Let's bow our heads and pray. I just want to encourage you to just submit yourself to God afresh. Let go of the pen. Stop, stop trying to fix it. Stop trying to make something. Trust God. Put the pen back in God's hand. Every time we take the pen in our hands, we ruin it, don't we? Let's put the pen back in God's hand. Say, Lord, I trust you. Not out loud, but in your heart. Lord, I trust you. My, my greatest days are ahead. I believe that. If, if you're 94 years old and today's your last day, today's your greatest day. Because tomorrow you meet Jesus face to face and I'll trade you. Just tell the Lord, I trust you. Jesus said, I'm through the prophet Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have for you. Not to harm you, but plans for a future and a hope. Lord, we trust you. We believe. We put the pen back in your hand. And we're going to believe that I haven't begun to imagine, or I haven't begun to dream all that you have for me. And Lord, some of that reward we won't see here. We'll see it there, but oh my gosh, when we see it, it'll blow us away. In Jesus' name. Could you keep your head bowed for one more moment? Maybe... You say, Michael, I, sadly, I resonate with the part about the chapters where the stuff's not that good because I feel bad before God. I feel like I'm not right with God. I just know in my heart I'm not right. See, the Bible says that his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So it stands to reason that his spirit also bears witness with our heart that we're not children of God when we aren't. So maybe you're here and you say, i got to get rid of this. I've got the same kind of conviction Onesimus had I feel like I've got a, I feel like I need a bath on the inside. What do I do? You repent and you trust. How do I do that? I'll help you with that in just a minute. In 30 seconds, I'm going to pray with everybody in the room. We're going to pray a prayer out loud. We're not going to embarrass you, ask you to leave your seat. We just want to know if you want to be included in that prayer of repentance and faith. You say, Michael, yes, I want to be right with God. What do I do? Just let me know that I'm praying for you, that you want in this prayer by raising your hand right where you are. That's it. Your hand up, and I'll see it. And I'll include you in this prayer. Thank you right here very much. And over here, thank you. Excellent. Over here. Great. Right over here. Over there. That's awesome. Do me a favor. Hold your hand up long enough for our host team to make their way to you. Right over here in the middle, too. Thank you. They're going to make their way to you and put a gift in your hand. Right over here. Thanks. The gift is a CD. It's six minutes long. You can literally, in fact, please literally listen to it in your car on the way home. Five key elements about this relationship and one next step. What, what do I do next? That'll be right there. And if you will, just, yeah, thank you for raising your hand back here. Be patient. Our hosting are making their way to you. Just keep your hand up, if you will. 
Also, you'll find attached to that CD a little white card and it asks for your name and address and phone number, that kind of stuff. Fill it out. We will not embarrass you or hound you or hassle you. What we do is serve. So we're going to serve you. We're going to contact you to see if you need a Bible, if you have prayer requests, if you have any questions. We're here for you. So just leave that on the seat, the little white card, and a host team will pick it up after you leave and we'll be able to serve you better. Anybody else want to get in on this prayer? Now's the chance. I've got to close, so just slip your hand up if that's you. You want in on this prayer. We'll include you right now. Anybody else? Awesome. Everybody out loud together. Ready? Jesus, thank you for that cross where you paid for my sin. I admit and confess I have sinned against you. I got some bad chapters. Please come into my life. Forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry. Cleanse me. Make me right with God. I trust you. I believe in you. My confidence is in your sacrifice on my behalf. From this moment forward, I want to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give a hand to those who raised their hands. Congratulations. Best move you ever made.